Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Um, I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones, and any members using electronic devices to access their committee papers should please ensure they're turned to silence. Uh, I've received apologies today from Kenneth Gibson and Emma Harper, MSP, is attending in his place. Uh, Emma, do you have any relevant interest to declare? No, I do not. Thank you very much. Our first item of business is a round table of evidence session as part of the committee's inquiry into arts funding. Um, the inquiry follows on from our work last year in regular funding and we aim to consider the wider issues um, on the future of the funding of arts organisations and we're particularly interested in how we support our artists and our cultural freelancers in Scotland and we're looking uh, hopefully at uh, models uh, past and present and around the world in terms of sustaining uh, not just our arts infrastructure but um, our individual talent. Um, so we have a uh, Fantastic round table this morning, and I would like to welcome Professor Richard DeMarco, CBE, um, Harry Josephine Giles, David Leddy, Artistic Director of Fire Exit Theatre Company, Rona Matheson, Chief Executive of Star Catchers Theatre Company, uh, Ken Matheson, a jazz musician, and Ray Raymond Villa Villacazzi, uh, Artistic Director of Neo Productions. Um, the inquiry is wide-ranging um, and we are focusing on a number of themes uh, this morning. I I'd like to start um, on the support for artists um, because you've all made um, uh, written submissions and I'd like to thank you very much for that because I found the written submissions uh, really useful, um, particularly in terms of some of your suggestions uh, for arts funding and uh, there, many of them are very innovative. Um, and also the barriers, particularly for yourselves as cultural freelancers. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start with Harry Josephine Giles, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned in your submission, um, it's easier to get money if you have money. And um, you talked about how um, organisations which employed um, financial officers, fundraising officers, found it easier to, to get grants. And obviously that has particular barriers um, for artists um, working on their own. Um, I wonder if you would want to elaborate on that and perhaps some of the interesting solutions that you had to that particular challenge? Sure. Um, so the basic problem here is that um, the majority of um, the majority of money that you get uh, to make art comes from public funding bodies and in order to get that money you have to fill out a funding application and filling out a funding application is um, a really specific and quite difficult skill and it's a skill that you have to learn um, it's a skill that you have to really work at I've been doing it about 10 years now and I just about understand it um, and it's not a skill that has any correlation whatsoever to artistic talent or merit. Um, so um, if you're any good at it, and I'm, I'm lucky enough that I've got decent at it, then you're better able to get the money. And if you're no good at it, even if your art is brilliant, then you have to pay somebody else to do it for you. Um, which is why in arts organisations we have fundraising officers. We employ people within arts organisations who have that specific set of skills for persuading people to give you money. Um, <coughs> so that the people who are good at making art and managing art and directing art can focus on that stuff that they're better at doing. Um, but this obviously creates an inequality because then when you have an organisation that can pay a fundraising officer, they've got better getting money skills than freelance artists who are not being paid to do that. Um, as somebody who works as a freelance artist, I, I never get paid for my time writing funding applications. And as somebody who's a co-director of um, an arts organisation, Anatomy Arts, um, we, um, as we've got more money, we've been better able to pay me to do the work of trying to get more money. And if this sounds absurd, that's because it is absurd, <laughs> right? That we have to try and get money to pay me to get us more money. Because if we don't do that, then we're less able to get money to do the work that we want to do, which for the most part is just paying artists to make art. So, so one of my major suggestions on that is that um, when an arts organization is funded to have a fundraising officer, that that fundraising officer has some time set aside to support freelance artists, specifically freelance artists in their sector. 
that's, it's not that radical a suggestion because this is something that's already happening. Um, I've been really well supported by some organisations who support my work or who support Anatomy's work and have offered their fundraising officer to give their time to help me figure out how to write an funding applications. But that's entirely voluntary, which is reasonable enough. Um, but yeah, there is still an, equality, an, an inequality there that disfavours freelance artists and makes it harder for us to get money. Thank you very much for that. Does anyone else want to come in on that particular uh, subject? Yeah, yes, please. If yes. I could. Um, the point that uh, Josephine makes there is uh, particularly acute with uh, black and minority ethnic people, um, some of whom will not have even the language skills to be able to, um, you know, the English is not their first language and they don't have, this, you know, normal Scottish skills of expressing themselves normally, let alone in some very archaic forms that you get from Creative Scotland. This is an issue I've raised with Creative Scotland for years. Um, they do say we will look at giving internal support to organisations like that, but the reality of it is it's, it's very um, thin on the ground, really. So, yes, I mean, to have uh, paid, um, you know, application people who can help you with applications would be a very, very useful thing to help, particularly with black and minority ethnic organizations. Anyone else want? Ken, uh, David. Uh, say that as a, as a measure of the amount of work that Harry Josephine is, is talking about, that uh, we, for the last, uh, I think, nine years, have been RFO funded. We are no longer. We announced our closure yesterday. Um, but before that, when I was project funded, I worked full time for 12 months of the year running the company. Mm -hmm. And I was paid usually for about seven or eight weeks work. And I just stretched that money out over the 12 months. Running the company and that work of raising money and managing a company of that size with a very small staff took my full time for the rest of that year. I just wasn't paid for it. And so it's, you know, the situation that, that Harry Josephine is describing is very extreme mm -hmm. of the amount of unpaid work that goes into getting that project fund. Uh, Richard DeMarco, um, you obviously have a perspective going back quite a long way, if you don't mind my saying so, you say in your submission. Um, is the situation that's described uh, for artists today a historical one or is it something that's arisen more recently? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think the, uh, the, the main point I'd like to make is that things have changed dramatically in my lifetime. I mean, such a meeting, a meeting like this would be unthinkable in the days when the Arts Council of Scotland existed and which uh, represented the only body you could go to representing the government funding that uh, you probably needed. Um, and of course, the art speak that now you have to learn to negotiate all the pitfalls before you actually get anywhere near um, being considered as, how can I say, uh, a valuable contributor to the cultural identity of the nation. Well, all I can say is that now um, it's difficult for me to um, consider the uh, problems. I, I can see the. I, 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 I've read all, all all the statements made, and I feel very strongly that everyone's in a very difficult position. No, no one can be. How can I say happy about the situation? And I am feeling that. We're living in a very difficult, almost, well, a, t a time of crisis. And everything is unstable. And everything has to be short term. Because uh, there doesn't seem to be a view which takes you forward into the lifetime of those children who are protesting in the streets at the moment, representing uh, our, our school children. 
worried about a situation which is going to affect us all, which is the condition of the, of, of the planet within the, the cosmos. I don't think I've ever known uh, in my 88 years upon the planet, I mean, I don't think there's anybody in this room can possibly understand what that means. But it means I have very clear memories of something called the Second World War and the 50 years of the Cold War and what Scotland was all about when, in 1947, as a result of the war, there came into being a great gift which was unexpected, almost miraculous, and which was given to the people of Scotland in the name of the Edinburgh Festival. It brought an international stage to this country, uh, which has never been given to any other country in Europe. It was like being given uh, the space of the Olympics. It was a, an arts or cultural Olympiad that we were given. I don't think we've used it properly. And right now it's simply a money-making machine uh, which enables something like 2,000 stand-up comics to feel reassured that they have a future. Uh, I don't think it benefits Scotland in every corner of Scotland that I can think of. And I think there are many big issues here that we should be considering, uh, which is what is the role of any institution representing uh, a cultural identity uh, a, a contribution to this cultural identity of Scotland at a time when we are not sure about what that future is. Right. That's certainly given us a lot to think about. Thank you. Um, I'll just bring in Alexander Stewart because I know you had specific issues to do with... Thank you, Convener. I mean, you, you've, you've touched on this morning the whole idea about the support and the funding you have. Uh, and it's quite obvious that in the sector, uh, you live from hand to mouth, uh, you live on shoestrings, uh, depending, you're, you know, you're, you're all trying to capture that resource and that finance. Uh, and it may be project-led or it may be a, over a one or two year period. So you have to, uh, as you've already identified, bring in individuals to support you to achieve that. But is it the case that maybe there's a breadth of resource that cannot be infinitely given to you all, so it has to be given out in a, in a proportion, and that proportion sometimes depends on what's flavour of the month or what's flavour of the year, uh, and organisations like yourself have to adapt your programme or adapt your lifestyle or adapt your company to, to try and attract that. Is that very much how it is? Because that's what I'm seeing from reading some of your submissions. And as I say, without that professional support that you're asking for, you're, you have to have, uh, then you don't survive. I would say that's how it appears. I would say it's actually worse than that. That um, the way that the current funding system works claims to be giving you a series of priorities that you need to meet, but even if you're an organisation that does manage to meet those, the position that we were in is that we, we achieved to a high level in all of the priorities that they set, and they didn't fund us, and they refused to explain to us why they didn't fund us. So, as I say, you fill all the criteria, uh, and you're doing a really good job, and you still go to the wall, yeah. uh, and you don't get feedback telling you why. Yeah. It's just that the funding's no longer available, or it's it's not where we think we want to put money in this time. Or, uh, and I, Even blander than that, they would just repeatedly fall on the idea that it's very competitive, and mm. they would just generally repeat, we'll be creating a new fund in the future, and you could apply to that, and we've decided to give the money to other people. We had a three-and-a-half-hour-long meeting where we asked, I think, 20 times for an explanation, and they refused to tell us. So, so what, what needs to change in that environment uh, and for us to be involved in that process as well, because we have a role in that whole process too. For me, the highest priority is peer review. I don't know how other people like uh, Rona and Ken feel. You haven't said anything yet. Can I say something about, uh, to touch on this subject? Part of the problem 
is in the, the way the, bud, the, the absence of budgeting impinges on all of this. Now, I was going to say right at the outset, I don't see this as a, as a Creative Scotland bashing exercise because if Creative Scotland didn't exist, some other similar body would have to exist. It's nothing to do with that. It's the methodology they apply. Now, my other, the, the way I have survived as a professional musician is also to be an accountant. And I've split my year as much to music as I could afford to. Uh, and I've operated as a, as a full-time pro during that period. So it's varied from six months to a year to two or three months or whatever. Anyway, the upshot is I've had from two successive heads of music that there is no budgeting. There is a pot. It's not subdivided into genres. It's not subdivided into specific arts types like theatre, music, etc. Never mind the subgenres that exist within all of the panoply of the arts. So that, to me, as an accountant, is just madness. You couldn't run a sweetie shop like that. But it, it hits every one of us in the arts by making everything totally unpredictable. It turns the, what should be a budgeting and allocation exercise into a free-for-all for the entire arts community. First come, first served, loudest voice, that's how it works. It's what's known in accounting circles as midden accounting, as I referred to. You shovel the money in and nobody knows what, what's in there. They know the amount that's in there, but they don't know what it's for. And then they shovel some out at the end, and then suddenly you apply for touring funding or project funding towards the end of the financial year because an opportunity has arisen and there's no money left. And, and a relatively small number of people who seem to have the control base as to what is given and where it goes? Well, I think it's, there's, a, there's clearly some issue inside the, the funding body that the fin I mean, there are always tensions between finance and the other departments. And finance has the responsibility for maintaining the budget. So that's under, I understand, I get all of that perfectly. But it's how they then deal with it. Because if you don't know what it is that's costing you money but not re giving you returns, you can't do that in a sweetie shop. You need to know what actually creates your, your margin and creates your profit and what's costing you money. If they had proper budgeting broken down to genres, and it doesn't mean that that is a fixed figure. I mean, the, the health service is a classic example of how this can be made to work in very straightened circumstances where if there's a budget that's seriously underspent as the year progresses, then elements of that budget can be allocated to, to crisis areas where they've had unforeseen circumstances or whatever. So their technical term for that is viring the budget. But it's in academic accounting terms, it would be a subvention of part of that budget to another pot. And it, they can make it work. I don't understand why... And every business and every commercial business under the world has to make it work as well because nobody's got infinite resource. No, no. I think, I think um, there, are, there are a number of issues that we have. Obviously, Creative Scotland is the, the kind of primary funding uh, body uh, in Scotland. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that we have is that there is, if you are making art for art's sake, then Creative Scotland is the only route. As an organisation, Starcatchers, we, we are, some of our resource comes from Creative Scotland to do a very particular part of our activity. And we're funded from other areas in order to do the other work that we do. But uh, but if you're an individual artist or your you're, 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 you're daily work is purely about making art, then really Creative Scotland is your only mechanism for support. We have issues within local authorities who don't have statutory provision. Um, and I, uh, I have some questions around some of that, and particularly with uh, the, the evolution of cultural trusts that have meant that what provision there has been within some local authorities has been devolved to cultural trusts. And that that then has an impact on people in communities who are trying to make art and can access support locally to actually deliver that work. Um, 
within a kind of Creative Scotland landscape, we obviously, years ago, when I first started working in the sector, um, we did have a theatre fund, a, you know, dance fund, there, there were the different um, art form uh, funds, and a number of years ago, it probably came from the sector that we felt that actually we made much more, much more sense to have one pot of money. Um, but actually, hindsight is, a, uh, is one of those things that you look back and go, actually, there are the way that the open project money uh, resource has evolved has become much more problematic. You've got individual artists uh, kind of in in the the funding round with organisations kind of being uh, being judged against each other, and actually that doesn't seem to be the most appropriate way for that to to work. Um, there is an absolute need for uh, infrastructure and the organisations that we have to be supported, but I think there are some more creative ways that we need to look at that, whether they're regularly funded or whether they're smaller organisations um, who kind of operate through the, the, the project resource that's available. But I think that the, one of the biggest challenges I think we have at the moment is that we're really constricted by the, the funding the, the funding model that we, that we have. Because you end up having to follow the money to obtain the money. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you fit the criteria, you get it. And if you don't fit the criteria, you don't. Yes, I know. And I think that one of the biggest challenges is that there are lots of applications that absolutely do fit the criteria, but the resource is finite. So when you have lots of applications that are you know, as strong as others, then you're finding uh, uh, the funders having to find arbitrary reasons to say why they're not being funded. I think the, 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 uh, the need for peer review actually in the, in the funding process is something that we need to really uh, revisit. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I just, uh, to put in an, a perspective from the BME community, um, in Scotland, within the context of limited resources and what Creative Scotland have available to push out, as uh, some of my colleagues have said, um, what is happening is that it's not a level playing field, as uh, Harry has just uh, um, clearly articulated. And what that means is about two years ago, I asked Creative Scotland to give me figures as to how much of their available money is actually coming through to the black and minority ethnic communities. I think that the population is about 9% of Scotland is black and ethnic minority. I'm still waiting for two years to actually get answers as to how much. And I know why they can't tell us, because it's basically nothing. Um, so all this talk about inclusivity is just that, it's talk. The reality is that none of this available money, for whatever reason that Creative Scotland makes its decision, the truth of the matter is that none of that funding gets to include black and minority ethnic communities. And that's the reality of the situation, regardless of what the criteria may or may not be. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Annabelle. Uh, if I could, you know, picking up on some of these points, so... Um, in terms of Ken Matheson's point about veering and, and so forth, in, in many of the submissions the committee has received, um, uh, people have called for long-term funding. So how does that approach fit with those calls? I don't know if you're a proponent of those calls or not, but many are. So how would that approach fit? It, it's the nature of the funding system makes it very complex. If you're a large organisation, an established company, then you, you're you're in the, the uh, continuing funding field, which is on a three-year cycle. But you can still come a cropper in there, even if you're a very respected and, and well-established company. If you're, in a, if you're not in that category, I mean, I, I'll cite the example of what I was looking for, in that we're seeing a long-term decline in the audience for jazz. And if there's no audience for it, it will disappear at least in Scotland, it, because people cannot be expected to turn out, put in hours and hours of practice and turn out to play gigs for money that was actually, is now the same as it was in the 1980s. And that is the reality in the jazz world today, that most of the gigs you can get by picking up the phone and chasing them are going to pay something like 20 to 25 pounds a man. Now, nobody can live on that, uh, considering it a, a a player of any standard has got to practice constantly and play constantly in an improvising situation to maintain match fitness. So it, it, it works very, 
it works against people in the, the kind of smaller genres. <clears throat> My experience was I addressed this uh, about three, three or four years ago with the then head of music. He heard what I was saying, that the need was there to, to generate performance opportunities in order that the, um, the music can be protected. And I came up with a model. I'm not claiming this is foolproof, but it has to, that therefore means it has to involve the promoters, people who are actually going to take a, a risk and put something on. They've got to be part of this dialogue. And they very frequently get left out of the dialogue. We're sitting talking about arts funding, but they are actually very important. They're the people who get art to the public, whatever the art is. Um, so it had to involve that. And the, the, the method I came up with was that my band has, a, has a, a base figure fee. There's eight of us, so it's quite a hefty one. They're all new professional players, so they all have mortgages to pay, kids to feed. They can't go out and work for 20 quid. It has to be a working wage, a sensible working wage that reflects their talent as well. So it's quite a sizable figure. What we came up with, or what I came up with, was we'll give the promoter a 33% discount if the funding com uh, organisation covers that in order to get performances. And the, the aim was to get performances back into theatres, which have stopped pushing jazz. They won't programme jazz because they think they can't make money on it because they think there's no audience. There's no audience because people haven't heard it. They don't know what it is because it's been pushed right off the map by commercial music. But jazz is, is of the instant, um, even though you are working, in the case of my band, we're working off orchestrations, but every solo is of the instant and will never happen again in that form. So it, it is a very complex area, this one. But what I, we, we were successful with our first two applications. The third one was dismissed as being just more of the same. Now, this was because we were actually, you had to get into certain places in order to expand that and take the music further across Scotland. Um, it's easier to get a job for an eight-piece band in Glasgow and Edinburgh than it is in Inverness or Nairn or Helmsdale or any place outside of the central belt. And that, that was one of the crucial aims of this project. And it could never be a kind of one year, two year thing. It had to be an evolutionary thing. And it wasn't just for my band because I then told other people in the business who had good quality bands, here's a, here's a template, use it and see if it works for you because it has worked for us. The third year I applied for it, was a crucial year because we had three members of the band who were in their 70s and we needed to get fresh blood into this in order that it might continue because it's got an international reputation that's worth maintaining. Um, it was dismissed as just more of the same, but an element of that was to fund rehearsals to find the right people to fill, the right, fill these three chairs. Two of them have retired. I'm still stuck with it and I'm still doing all the unpaid admin. And the band has gone, because it was dismissed as just more of the same, um, the band went from a 25 performances in that third year of application that were agreed and, and ready to be contracted subject to funding, went from that to six. And nobody can live on six performance fees in a year. Um, I had a meeting with Creative Scotland, with the new head of music and um, the, so the, the jazz uh, representative in that department. And we went through it all and I was given all sorts of things that I should address. I was encouraged to reapply and asked to address certain points. All of those points had actually been covered in fine detail on the application. They just hadn't recognised it and understood it. So I then have to question how capable are, how much knowledge do the people who are doing the assessments actually have about the genres and what the actual life of a working artist and whatever genre? That's obviously touched on Erwin. I know that we want to get into peer review issues shortly, but just before we do, um, I mean, I think the point you've made about the lack of involvement of promoters uh, in relevant fields, obviously jazz being one, is a very uh, apt point and something that I hadn't reflected on. 
but I think something that the committee needs to reflect on. It's also very disappointing to hear what you say about Creative Scotland's approach to jazz because they don't seem to have one. Um, if they're just going to tell you that your application is just more of the same, I mean, what do they expect it to be? You know, it's jazz music and it is in it is an instant performance, as you rightly say, but the attitude that it's just more of the same. But I mean, do they not have any commitment to jazz as a, whether it's a, a, a medium? Whether it's a commitment to jazz or not, I can't, I can't possibly say. What it tells me uh, is that they, they don't have an analytical mind looking at the applications that come in to separate what is a one-off application for funding to make a specific thing happen or something that is actually a longer-term plan, which has been spelled out to them in three different applications, a longer-term plan to bolster the genre and try to ensure that it is successful. And my con one of my concerns is that conservatoires and music colleges are churning out youngsters. There's going to be nowhere for them to play unless there's a thriving scene. And the only way there's a thriving scene is if there's performance opportunities. So you get caught, this is a, it's, it seems as simple as ABC to somebody who's in the business. It just tells me that, that, that the people who are doing the assessing have no grasp on the reality uh, now, whether that's peculiar to the jazz, jazz genre or whether it's across the board, but from discussions we've had earlier on this morning, uh, it's pretty obvious that that is a prevalent problem. To go back yes. in, or Josephine, please. Thank you. Um, if I might touch on both of the previous questions, which is um, what's this role of long-term support and, and what do you do about the need to prioritise if funding is, is restricted? Um, and for me, we, uh, we've heard some good points there about the problems within Creative Scotland on, on long-term support. I think it's really vital to, to broaden the answer to both of those questions beyond Creative Scotland, because it, uh, this one public body shouldn't be the only way that the arts are supported, and it isn't the only form of long-term support. The two major forms of long-term support that are more or less gone, like more really entirely gone in Scotland now, are on the one hand local authority funding, which, which Rona has mentioned, um, and on the other hand, um, the benefit system, social security. Uh, now, it might seem a bit strange to you, but if I talk to folk that are 20, 30 years older than me, many of our major artists and many of our major organisations are built on people working as artists while uh, being on the dole. Um, and I've done that too. I built the beginning of my career on the dole. And I know I'm not supposed to do that, but it is what I did. Um, because there's no other way of doing all of this unpaid work unless you have a basic amount of financial support. For decades post-war, and it was part of the post-war settlement that was referred to before, being able to have some kind of level of social security while you began building an arts career, that's what enabled a flourishing of the arts post-war, and that is a form of long-term support. And the ability of local authorities to also have a role in that, whether that's the, the Greater London Authority or another one, they were huge funders of the arts. And both of those forms of social support, both of those forms of long-term support, were also, and this is picking up um, on Raymond's points, ways to diversify the arts because they're, they're lower barriers of entry and because those of us who are from any marginalised group, whether it's people of colour, whether it's women, whether it's disabled people, and let's remember that it was the defunding of disability arts organisations that led to this massive stramash a couple of years ago in the first place, those are the people who most need those kinds of support and who are most obstructed from accessing, and it is a major barrier, as has been pointed out, accessing support through Creative Scotland. So when it comes to prioritisation, for me, it's a strategic question, and it's also a political question. What do you want arts funding to do? For me, the function of any um, collective project, which is what government is, which is what arts funding is, is to further equality and justice and quality of life. And in the arts, quality of life is also quality of art. We want everyone to be able to participate in the arts as much as they want and to get access to good arts. 
the more diverse that is, I think, the better the art is, because the more people you have from different backgrounds doing art, the more interesting and exciting and new the, the art is, and that's what's being obstructed. So the question of prioritisation is, what can you do with arts funding to lower those barriers of entry, to diversify the arts, um, to enable those who are marginalised to participate more fully? And that, for me, is, is how prioritisation should be directed. Two things. One is that I had an interesting experience a few years ago at a, a conference in Europe where somebody European just laughed at the UK saying, well, you can't get arts funding in the UK. You can only get funding for social engineering. Like, Brit British arts funding doesn't believe in funding art. You have to prove that you're, uh, that you're achieving some kind of social aim rather than an artistic aim. And my experience of the the funding stramash, as Harry Josephine called it, was that I had a, a, a meeting with Creative Scotland where Janet Archer said to me, I don't think as an organisation Creative Scotland is very good at funding art. And I said, don't you think that's the most damning thing that the head of a, an arts funding body could say about itself? And she shrugged and said, I, I suppose so. And I think that's very revealing. I'd, I'd like to... I'd like to respond to that just as quickly as I can, um, because I don't want what I just said to be mistaken for, for, for social engineering. Um, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand. Um, I think that diversity policy um, and the, the inclusion strategies are usually, not always, but usually sticking plasters on the basic problem, which is money, which is access, equal access to the, to the resources. And it, 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 it needs active inclusion strategies to, to get past that. But really, the more equal you make access to the money, the more diversity comes. It's that way around. You don't fix diversity with a diversity policy. You fix diversity by enabling people to get the money, and then the art happens. I completely agree, I okay. completely agree that that leads to better work. Yeah. yeah. There's a fundamental problem that's nothing to do with Scotland or creative Scotland, and that is that the arts in general in the UK are not appreciated in the way they are in many other countries. I, I did a stint of about three, three and a half, four years as treasurer of the Scottish Jazz Federation, which has gone um, and is not sadly missed, I have to say, from, from the jazz community, because it never provided any, made any tangible benefits to the, to the musicians. Um, who are the, obviously the bedrock of the, the form. Anyway, the, there was a, an, an initiative by the French equivalent of the Scottish Jazz Federation to jazz services in London and to the Scottish Jazz Federation about setting up a touring network covering France and the UK. And uh, everybody thought that was a terrific idea. And then when we, they, we got round to talking about the, the, what the money would be, um, the French walked away and shook their heads because they were looking for something like three times the money that they would be the best that would be on offer here because that's what they're used to being paid because the culture is, is actually appreciated there. You go to countries like Brazil, the, cult, the, the national culture is almost fetishised in Brazil. I've lived in Brazil and was just astonished at how well musicians could be paid for quality work. Um, there is a, a different mindset, at, 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 almost certainly at national government level, but there's also a community feel about it. And that's why I think in Scotland, it's, it's so important that we get this right, that we need to find a way of doing it. And in the I don't want to get political. There are enough politicians around the table for that. But, but in, a, in a, a country where there is a very restricted amount of national funding, that's going to be a very difficult equation to solve. I know that there are other members want to talk about international models, and perhaps we can come to that later. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on this subject of peer review, and because I, I can see that there would be pitfalls to peer review as well. Yes, there will be. There are pitfalls there, um, but it's down to well, there have to be ways of uh, 
ferreting out people who have got vested interests to ensure that they don't affect the, the dialogue. But I would rather have an application reviewed by people who actually knew what I was talking about than people who ha have no understanding of the life of a musician or an artist or a sculptor or whatever. I've got a son who's a sculptor and he's had to go into full-time teaching in order to make a living. I think that... I think there are definitely... Uh, you know, we've, we've had peer review previously uh, under Scottish Arts Council and it wasn't, again, like these things either. It's not perfect, but it allows um, the voices of the sector to be heard through the decision-making process. Um, and I think when we have this tension between this, the different sectors that we work in within the arts and the, the funding body, that you know, how we build the relationship and the communication and the trust between the, the, the sectors is really, really important. And actually having peer review as part of of um, those decision-making processes, I think, are, uh, is absolutely essential. It's challenging, you know. You, uh, you know, within a, a theatre context, within a children's theatre context, we have a very small children's theatre sector, which um, is looked at internationally as one of the the, the shining lights of um, the Scottish arts scene. But there's a very small number of people who have real understanding of work for children. Um, so when you're having applications reviewed, I think there's uh, there are tensions there from my perspective. Um, but I would absolutely welcome the, the idea that as part of a, a, a funding process that other people who understand uh, working in our sectors, working with theatres, working in communities, that there's that input into that, that process. Um, I, I, also, I think the pitfalls of peer review are actually quite easy to mitigate against. I think when you have uh, rolling panels, so people don't sit on a panel for a really long time, when you have panels that are large enough that individual members can't unduly influence them, you can have uh, split panels where the first round of decision making is done by a very large group who offer very brief feedback, and then it goes to a panel of 10 people who sit around a table, and that's before you get to asking people to formally you know, declare any interests that they have. And I think all of those things mitigate against a lot of the downfalls much more than the system that we currently have, which is that a very small number of people who've remained in post for a long time make decisions. And, and if you um, actively diversify the panels, yeah. if you make sure that they're not just representative, but are taking affirmative action and who's on the panels, then you also start to undo the, the power structures, yeah, that are there in the decision-making at the moment, because it's currently left to who's employed by Creative Scotland, and that's subject to exactly the same power structures as everything else. So, so the, the peer review, if you diversify it beyond population levels, um, then, then you can address that too. I would add that part of that diversity is also including people on those panels who are not currently funded. Mm -hmm. Stuart, did you want to come in on that point? Yes, yeah, yeah. thanks. So just a question on the peer review. Uh, so would you be suggesting that the criteria would, actually, would still be the same, but then uh, notwithstanding the fact that people and, uh, and individuals on the, uh, on the, the panels could, uh, could change? I would say those are different issues. I think, I think okay. the criteria of how um, funding is apportioned is a, is a separate question. And the, but peer review... Peer review is like democracy. It's not perfect. There are things wrong with it, but it's the best option that we have. Raymond. Yeah, with regards to you know the criteria, I think that the, that peer review uh, group could also uh, input as to what the criteria for funding is. It's about giving artists a voice, and as, as as my colleagues have said, you can rotate the people that are on that and diversify it. But don't just limit them to the decisions and and, and the applications. They can also be part of your resource in making the criteria in the first place because they know what they're talking about. So that would be a way of using that to to make sure that the criteria itself is actually fit for purpose. Can I then ask another question? Who then selects? Uh, the individuals to be on the on the peer review panel. First thing I'd say, you need the balance between people being able to apply and people being asked to apply. Um, I think previously, when we have had peer review, often those panels have been dominated by arts administrators who've applied for it, and there's not many high-level artists in that group. Um, 
I, and I think, yeah, often those high-level artists are too busy, but if they'd been asked to do it, they would have done it. And uh, so, yeah, I think it needs to be open to anyone who wants to apply and can prove that they are knowledgeable in the field, but also it needs to have some degree of selection as well so that you make sure that when we look at that list of peers, it really is a list of diverse, highly qualified people. Richard DeMarco, you, you suggest that in your submission that um, the panel should be composed of artists from various disciplines that were remunerated for their time. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. Yes, um, and we're talking about peer review and um, you suggested in your submission that uh, committees um, uh, awarding grants should be composed of artists from various disciplines. Well... <laughs> My heart goes out to anyone who uh, is applying for funding for something which I delight in, which is the great art form we call jazz. Nobody can control or anticipate or quantify the value of uh, jazz uh, as an art form. And um, I'm thinking of Mike Hart, <laughs> Today. He was a great friend of mine, and uh, he, he, without him and, and his way of life and his commitment to the language of jazz, we wouldn't have this great uh, tradition in Scotland the way it is now. And it's in a very how can it, fragile state, I can see. And I'd like to know how many jazz players... <laughs> Uh, actually make the decision about how much funding goes towards the development of this great expression of culture. Zero. Zero. Okay, yeah. right. So I just want you to know that... Um, ah. I, I just want you to know that if we're looking at this committee, the words culture, tourism... Europe and external affairs dominate. And I'm not sure now that you can equate whatever you call culture with tourism. It's a different ball game that we're talking about here. And that is uh, suffering that is not actually helping Scotland at the moment, certainly not Edinburgh. I'm talking about tourism. It's completely out of control and it doesn't improve the cultural identity of this city. Um, and I was thinking of the word Europe, because we are not actually, uh, in this particular ending of the second decade of, the, uh, of, of this third millennium, uh, we, we're not um, in control of the great affairs, of the great political um, um, game that's being played. And I'm worrying about how this country of Scotland can actually be in a position to contribute the way it should, because at the very heart of European culture is a Scottish dimension. And we're being deflected away from... I mean, Scottish jazz is different from English jazz, from French jazz. There's a particular quality. And I remember Sandy Brown playing at lunchtime at the Art College way back with Al Fairweather. Uh, I mean, if you don't know these names uh, and you're on a committee judging what kind of money should go towards... Uh, the, the development of jazz, you probably are unfit to make a decision. Who on earth was Al Fairweather? And what was he? He was an architect. And who, who was Sandy Brown? He was an architect. But they were actually really about the sound of jazz. And they contributed a sound which um, affected the whole population of the Edinburgh College of Art at the time, we didn't realise we were being given a great gift. This sound of jazz on the highest level of achievement 
was permeating the college every lunchtime. Now, I can say now that I am worried about the whole business of how we deal with the word culture. I think culture should be identified with what I think caused the Edinburgh Festival to come into being, which is uh, another word, and that is healing. The Edinburgh Festival came into being not because people wanted to make money or uh, to, to uh, develop a tourist industry, but because the world was in desperate need of finding out how it could possibly consider a future. It was the year 1947, two years after the, the, the disaster, the tragedy of the Second World War. And it came into being because the Lord Provost knew full well then that it was about the flowering of the human spirit. And it was about the need to heal the terrifying wounds that society was enduring at that time. Not just the rationing of food, and the rationing of clothes, but the rationing of light, energy. Thank you very much. Now, I just want you to know that we're in a very dodgy situation here, and we should try to see, we should be asking the question of what do we mean by juxtaposing the words culture with tourism, Europe, and external affairs. In this particular session, we're entirely, I can reassure you, we're entirely focused on culture. So at that, I'm going to bring in Tavi Scott. I'm very tempted to get into that philosophical discussion, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, perhaps better not. I, I just, I, um, David uh, Leddy, so you've already touched on this, but the bit I really thought was interesting in the context of peer review in your submission is, is your observation that organisations should not receive funding unless 80% of their assessments in the last two years have been rated very good or uh, excellent. Is that So describe what you mean by that. that <coughs> under so. the Arts Council, the, your work was regularly assessed to check its quality, to check that if we're trying to fund excellence, are the people that we're funding excellent? And so an assessor would be paid to come and see if you're a theatre maker, come and see your production. They filled in a pro forma review where they were asked to give ratings across you know, six categories to each of the different elements of your production and an overall rating. And you got a series of those over time. And in theory, what should have happened at the time was that 80% of those needed to be in the top two categories for you to move into the group of applications that were considered to be funded at all. So the idea is that you know people who are not good enough get yeah. taken out at the beginning. When we moved to Creative Scotland rather than the Scottish Arts Council, assessment of artistic quality was got rid of completely. Mm. There is absolutely no assessment of whether or not people are good at what they do. Mm. There's only assessment of business priorities. So your, your assessment, your, your thought is that the previous system had some considerable advantages. Yeah, the previous system the worked well. And what, what yeah. shocks me most is, is that I talked to um, senior management at Creative Scotland about this and they took copious notes because they didn't know that this is how the system used to work such a short time ago. And Ken Masson's point that th those assessors that you described would have been in his case someone who knew jazz. Yeah, they were peers. Yeah. I, they were. I was one of them at the time. I mean, I had personal experience of this. I was invited to a music advisors or assessors meeting where they were discussing new contracts. I pointed out I wasn't actually a, a music advisor to the creative, uh, to the Arts Council, but I had, there was a, a journalist of the same name as me uh, who wrote on jazz for the Scotsman, um, and he was a music advisor. So I pointed out that they probably got the wrong guy. <laughs> they said, no, no, it's you we want. I said, you mean you want the journalist or the, or the drummer? Yes. And they said, we want the drummer. So I went along. I was the only person, there were 25 music advisors from covering different genres. I was the only one who'd actually made a living as a performer. Mm -hmm. Everybody else had come from an administration, or in one case, a journalism background. OK, so there's a, there's a lesson so there. It, 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 I agree. In, in principle, it is a system that should work. It has to be made to work. Yeah, it has to be done properly. Yeah. And Raymond, want to come in? Yeah. 
I mean, I think I would absolutely agree that, that there is a need for artists to be involved as a arts administrator, um, producer, you know, I, I sit in that world, but, I, you know, I advocate for people like me, but I absolutely, we, the, we cannot do the work that we do without the artists, but having that balance of people who understand the, the, the kind of the business side of things alongside the artists who make the work, because what, you know, what is the point of any of this if we don't understand what the artists want to make, how they want to make it, and what they need in order to do that. Raymond. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been in Scotland 26 years, so I do remember when the um, uh, Arts Council used to do assessments. Now, a couple of days, I spoke to a very senior person in uh, Creative Scotland who told me that work from black and ethnic minorities was generally viewed as substandard. Um, and I agreed, because we are not funded. And the assessment, the problem with it is, you have organizations, I'll take one like, for example, the Lyceum, who get two million quid. So the assessors will assess that organization's work in the same way that they will assess work that's done by ethnic minorities who get no money whatsoever. So you can't compete with the lighting, with the costumes, with the uh, uh, quality of production that the Lyceum is able to, 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 uh, uh, to put forward because you simply don't have the funds to do so. However, the assessment criteria is the same, and that does disadvantage people who've not been funded to begin with. So assessment and, and the people who are on it and the resources that you've been given needs to be put into, the, in, into account when you're being assessed in terms of the work. Being incorporated within a pro forma, that part of the review is an acknowledgement of what level of support people get at the moment, and so you can have a realistic expectation that if someone is receiving no funding or is receiving 500 pounds, mm. they don't have the support that they have if they're in the building that the, the has too many pounds. The old system didn't do that. Yes, you're right. Hey, Josephine. Sure. I, I also want to just send a note of caution on, on, the, on the quality assessment, and half of my point was just made there, so I'll leave that. I entirely agree with that. Um, the other half is I, I am a bit concerned about levels of monitoring and assessment of quality, both because of the power structures that are involved in that, but also because in arts, as in education, as in actually most of society, I think we have a bit rather too much assessment and monitoring, and, and that also costs money. <laughs> and I, I just want to always bring it back to the money, but like, there is a huge amount of money spent in the arts doing monitoring, doing reports, and not spent on making art. And I just have this suspicion, and, and it is a little tricky to get your head around sometimes, that actually if we did far less of that, we might get better art. Just as if we tested kids less in school, they might learn more. Um, That's why we've got the system that we have now. Yeah, I, I'm not totally disagreeing. I'm just, just being cautious about it, that I wouldn't want loads of monitoring on what the art is, because the more time you spend doing that, the less time you spend making art, and the more the power structures get involved. Um, and yeah, there's also this, I'm trying not to make this philosophical, but look, are, what happens if every time you're funded to do something, you're sitting there anxious that it's going to be funded badly or your, your whole career is over? Like, we deal with that enough with the reviews as it is. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that, about the effect that that has on the art. Sure, yeah, there are solutions, but yeah. I'll leave it there. Yeah. I don't know why there was a move away from the old system uh, to the new system. It was, it was for the reasons that Harry Josephine is, is saying, lots of people hoped that if we got rid of um, uh, assessing artistic quality that, that it would just allow artists to flourish and make great work and it would save money. Um, and I don't think that's what's happened. To give us a perspective on the assessment of artistic quality, is there a rule for that in funding of arts? Well, I think, for example, I, I find unrecognisable uh, this thing called the Edinburgh Festival, a great flagship, uh, as it is now, uh, from what it was in its first 40, 50 years. I've experienced every single Edinburgh Festival. Oh, by the way, I'd like to point out there's something called zero funding. Uh, and for about 15 years, I operated on the basis that I had, uh, I had no funding. I would, I would create uh, an international program with no money at all, 
and at the end of the year, I'd break even. Now, wh how many people would take that uh, attitude and see that the arts, which are not about uh, commerce, not about commodifying everything in sight, but are about an expression of our inner being, our souls, and the soul of a nation, and therefore, uh, they should be uh, forever um, linked to the world which we call education. Our educational system at the moment in, in Scotland has fallen very, very well below the standard that I was used to in my, uh, my youth. Um, I, I'm saying now that I think that we have to completely rethink this whole idea of what is the power of the, um, how can I say, the cultural language that we use. It is the one and only language that we have to express our love of life. Therefore, without it, society collapses. Do you realize all the political uh, statements that can be made by any political party add up to nothing compared to one great sound by one great jazz musician or one great poet. And I'm thinking you cannot, and I've discovered this because I don't know, I, th I think I must have produced in my lifetime something like three and a half thousand productions, theatre productions and exhibitions. And most of the funding came from outside of Scotland because I realized that Scotland wasn't geared up to actually uh, providing the money. And the Edinburgh Festival, through many of its most outstanding years, had to depend on foreign money, on, on the, the British Council, and on the kind of funding that, in uh, that you identify with Europe. I'm actually very conscious as I sit here that I came into violent um, contact with the powers that be. It was called, I think, the Scottish Arts Council. Uh, and they didn't like the way I was suggesting that art had to be, on the highest level, something that we used uh, to deal with the terrifying problem of our ever-growing population of human beings back um, in our prisons. And I concentrated all my attention on the whole idea that the art world had to encompass the world of uh, penal re reform. That didn't go at all, it didn't go down at all well, and I was accused of bringing dishonor to the meaning of art. <laughs> What a great achievement. I brought this order to the meaning of art in Scotland. And, of course, this honor to the meaning of art uh, with regard to the DeMarc or whatever it was called, Gary. It wasn't a Gary anyway, but just a way of life, which was a continuation of what the Travis was all about or the paperback bookshop. And I'm thinking that you've got to fight Fight, fight with all your might for the language which you dare to call art, because it's the one language that will somehow or another move in a, in a way which is mysterious beyond belief towards uh, those generations that, that are yet to come. I dislike intensely the fact that I was told you can no more have anything like an annual uh, support from the Arts Council. It's gone. You are now, uh, you, you, you now are, are, are re <laughs> reduced to this whole concept of project funding. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be involved in something so stupid and pathetic because what I'm concerned about is the fact that the language of art lasts well beyond any one lifetime. It should be the language we're using 
to actually as a gift towards future generations. And it should be the language which, if, if you are a serious politician, you know is going to be the legacy that uh, you deserve to give to uh, anyone you love who is at the moment a child and is going to be breathing the air and drinking the water of the world in which we live. So I'm saying that I don't think I would... I, I don't regret that moment when the Arts Council said, you are now cast out. You don't belong to our world of um, uh, government thinking. I, I was very happy that that happened because I, I thought, I, I believe that all the artists that I represented, and that's people like Hugh McDermott, people like, um, hmm, I'm trying to think, Ian Hamilton Finlay, troublemakers, because they were asking the kind of questions that politicians very rarely are in a position to ask. And they were actually defenders of the truth, because that's really what it's all about. Art is about truth, telling the truth, it's not about false truth, it's about truth, and it's also about beauty. The things that we cherish most, the things that we, that this building is supposed to represent. And I'm thinking it's ridiculous that when I was given the job of being director of the Edinburgh International Festival's uh, official program of uh, contemporary culture, I had to raise seven million pounds, and not a penny of that came from Scotland. It came from countries like Poland, Romania, uh, the, 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 the Baltic states, and these countries actually were in desperate need during that time of expressing their concept of truth, political truth as well as cultural truth, uh, at a time when they were fighting for their lives, for their identity. I'm going to have to just stop you there because I know that Emma Harper had some questions about international uh, working, uh, and I'm going to thank you very much for that and move on to Emma. Yep, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I am interested in how innovative funding approaches uh, occur in other countries. And I know that uh, in the Starcatcher submission, it says our European neighbours recognise the vital importance of funding theatre and dance for young audiences. Denmark has over 70 full-time companies, but Scotland continues to lag behind. So I'm interested to hear about um, some of the examples in our submission from all across the planet including our European neighbours. So um, what could we do different? How could we learn from our European neighbours and others? Um, to, I suppose to lead on from that point, I mean, that's 70 fully funded children's theatre companies in a country that's the same size as Scotland. And uh, they have the opportunity, they're funded to make work. And if it's not very good, it's okay. They're funded to experiment, take risks, and um, also make some exceptional, exceptional work. Um, that's a, a decision that their Arts Council has made to invest in, uh, in, in those, uh, those organisations. Um, at the moment, we are part of a, an Erasmus Plus project. We're working with um, a company from France and a company from the Netherlands, and our French colleagues, the artists there, are in a position, so we are paying for our artists um, to ensure that they have the resource they need to, to live within the, the delivery of this project. The French artists are able to kind of um, are supported by the state, um, which I think we when we find we find this out sort of as we were kind of going through this project. Where was the resource coming for the French artists? Where was the resource coming for the Dutch artists? And this is what we were doing for the Scottish artists. The Erasmus Plus program only provides a small um, uh, proportion of the resource we need to fully deliver the project that we're doing. Um, but those two French artists artists, because they've delivered a certain amount of uh, activity, are able to benefit from a stipend from the state. And that's how they're able to participate in that project. I, I would add to that that, that, that 
personally at the point in my career where I needed to no longer have a day job, uh, my solution to that was that I did a paid PhD. Uh, and that small amount of money of the stipend that I received for the PhD, and it was a practice-based PhD, so it allowed me to uh, focus entirely on making that work. And I spoke to lots of European colleagues who said, oh, we, just, we have a similar thing where you just you ask the arts funding body for that, and that you reach a point in your career where you've shown that you're an artist of promise, and they'll say, here is 8,000, 10,000 euros to see you through the next year. You can focus on your work. And that money is incredibly good value to the funding body because that person is at a point in their career where they suddenly blossom into being able to create a lot of work. And I think that's one of the gaps that we have at the moment in focusing entirely on organizations and that individual artists who are not yet at the point of setting up an organization and may never be somebody who works in a, a form that needs an organization don't get supported in that way. And it, it's really good value. I took exactly the same route out as a free, yeah. freelance artist. My PhD funding runs out in September and I have literally no work of any kind after September. Um, so that's gonna be an exciting time. And similarly, um, the only way that I've been able to develop to, to earn a minimum wage as an artist, which is what I earn, I almost never get any more than a minimum wage, um, is through funding, not just through Creative Scotland, but getting money off the British Council, which is, I think, UK government money. It's certainly government money, and I think it's UK. Um, and um, off European Union-funded projects in Europe. Um, until this year, I've had more money from European countries and from w through EU funding than through um, Scottish funding, although things have got better for me this year, which was quite nice. Um, from that experience, I'd, I'd love to hear if Rona knows of any other European forms of um, support for artists, because I know that you work quite a lot in Europe as Starcap, so I'd love to hear about more of those. Two others that I've heard about are, in Finland, um, there is subsidised housing for artists, um, which, wow, what a dream. Um, and I think also in France, um, there's tax breaks as well as the possibility of a stipend for somebody who's working as an artist. And I think these, these forms are so worth exploring because of that diversification. And also, even if ideologically it sounds a bit weird to just give artists a house or give artists a tax break, it actually works out cheaper because they're not then applying for funding, they're not then doing all the monitoring, they've got this time to make the art and they make more art and they do make more economic impact if they're doing that. But I'd love to hear if Rona knows of more. Um, there, are, there are a few. I don't necessarily have all of the, the kind of the details. I know, I know that in um, in the Netherlands, uh, colleagues there, it's it's easier, I suppose, for some of them as individual artists to access uh, funding that they need. We are in discussions with. Uh, um, uh, an organisation that's attached to a university in Norway where they have, we always lead to Norway, and they have huge amounts of money to run programmes of artist residencies. So the artists are funded to be there for periods of time to expect, to develop uh, ideas and, and work. Um, they run hundreds of residencies every year and the artists are, the artists are funded. Um, I know, yeah, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head about some of the, the other things at the moment, but I could certainly do some, uh, uh, some investigations um, and, sh and share those. Mm -hmm. Ross, did you want to come in at that point? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Kinder. Um, I was struck by a couple of things that, that Ken said. The first was the um, mention of Brazil. I mean, my understanding is part of that is formed by the way Brazilian culture has developed over centuries. Part of it was uh, a five-year period in which it truly flourished because Brazil appointed an internationally renowned songwriter and guitarist as their minister for culture, and he transformed government policy uh, around that. But one thing I want to uh, touch on was something that you said earlier, um, uh, those who shout the loudest here. Um, often uh, being the ones who, who get in the door now. If we think of the, the stramash uh, of, of a couple of years ago, that was certainly to some extent the case. I think everyone would understand uh, those who were uh, facing closure because they were losing out on funding they expected to get. Of course, they're going to shout as loud as they can to try and secure that funding. But how do we build a, a new model in Scotland, a sustainable model, that minimises the chance, because obviously those who shout the loudest are those who are starting off with the most privileged, the most connections, they're networked. Um, how do we design a system that um, doesn't allow for undue advantage in those kind of situations where those who can shout the loudest create enough pressure and get funding they might not have otherwise got? 
Yeah, I mean, if, if I could come in on that from, uh, again, a BME um, perspective. At the moment, in terms of the funding, the BME community gets zero. If you were to increase that from zero to eight or nine percent of the available funds, that would transform the landscape of uh, art in Scotland. And there is one thing that I want to say on that particular point. Scotland is a wonderful, diverse country to live in, but its artistic output does not reflect that at all. So by increasing from available funds, zero to eight percent to reflect the current nation's demographics, that, that would be a model for me which would um, a, reflect Scotland's openness and diversity and, and project Scotland as a country that's welcoming uh, to people of all creeds and colours, which it is, to live in, but that's not what you see in the art. And are you aware of other countries that do that better for minority communities? The Americans do. Um, I'm from South Africa, the South Africans do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the culture that's produced by a country should reflect its citizens. And Scottish culture is all about tartan and, you know, haggis. Scotland is changing, but that is not being reflected in the artistic output of this country. There are many countries that do very successfully at that. Okay. Reply, and reply to Rossi's um, question. I think if you're going to, to sit down and rationalise a new method of funding or, or overhaul the existing method of funding, it has to start with the inclusion of the arts community. It can't be designed in absentia by management consultants for some ridiculous fee, because that is the way, very often, bureaucracy deals with these problems. Um, it has to involve people who actually understand what life is like if you can't make any money from doing the thing that drives your life. Because that's, that's one of the issues. For people in the arts, it is actually a life force. They're there to do this. Whatever their genre is, whether it's performance arts or, or fine arts or whatever, they are driven to do this. It's a voice within. And if we don't let that voice out, then we stifle all of these talents. I can remember going back to the days of the Scottish Arts Council, um, trying to understand, I wasn't applying for anything, I was trying to understand how the funding system worked because with my accountant's hat on, I was interested in knowing how the system worked and if there were opportunities for some plans I had to develop some musical ideas, I would be interested in pursuing them. Basically, it, bo it boiled down to, uh, well, we don't have you on our radar because you're not an established artist. Well, I'd worked on four continents as a professional musician and was better known in New York than I was in, in Murray Place. Um, that's neither here nor there. The, the point I was going to make was when we got into how you get into the position of being an established artist, I asked them, OK, so there's this eight-year-old kid called Wolfgang Mozart living in Wester Hills. How does he actually get his talent developed? How do we know there's not a Wolfgang Mozart in Wester Hills right now who could be perhaps one of the most influential in whatever art genre he or she is, is talented in? How do we know that these people will ever actually be recognised? And there was no answer to that. Absolutely none. So it has to involve anything, that any restructuring has to involve the arts community at a very significant level. I think we need to look at the, the, that sense of what we've got. We've got a hierarchy of funding that starts with the national companies being funded direct from, uh, from government that then goes to a, a second stage of Creative Scotland and the, and the hierarchy there of regularly funded organisations. And then you have uh, those that are in receipt of project funds. And there was a sense that, who, that, that from 
Creative Scotland that if you are that there is no distinction between in their eyes between regular funding and project funding that there is no hierarchy but having sat on both sides of that fence there is a hierarchy in terms of the relationship that you have um, but I think we also need to look at how do we bring those local and national structures together and again it comes back to my concerns around the lack of um, support uh, from local authorities for uh, artists and uh, arts organisations. Um, you know, I think I've been uh, coming back to that international perspective. I have a, a, a colleague from Ireland who, I, who uh, I've, I've been talking to recently, and they have local authority support. It's not necessarily huge amounts of money, but it's support that allows them to take work to different parts of Ireland, as well as being supported through the National Arts Funding Body. Um, they also have a, a completely different agency that's looking at how they're exporting their uh, their Irish cultural uh, product. So I think there's there it goes for me it goes much much far farther than just what is the funding structure that we have within Creative Scotland. How do we bring all of these things together so that we actually have a a national funding strategy for the arts that actually supports work from the grassroots community right up um, and it's recognised and it's clear um, and that it allows artists to do the work that they want to, to, to do. David. Um, I, that's just reminded me of a, a very simple thing that goes back to what we talked about earlier about long-term support and the idea of fixed, uh, fixed time periods. I've often suggested that there could be a flexible time period, that organisations at a particular point in their development say, we think we're in a point where a year of funding would be great for us, and a major building, for example, says we need 10-year commitment, and that a touring company might say, we'd like five years, and the funder might come back and say, we think you're at a three-year point. And that, so the idea of everyone being fixing a three-year term and should we make that longer or should we make that shorter seems it, it seems like there's a simple solution that it can slide and you can ask for a certain amount and then negotiate what you actually get um, <clears throat> so so to come back to Ross's question of um, how do you make sure it's not just those who shout the loudest I do just want to um, pay tribute again to the fact that that stramash was started by um, well, one of them <laughs> was started by an almost total defunding of disability arts in Scotland and um, that happened because nobody had noticed that's what all the cuts were doing and it was disabled artists who were doing a lot of shouting and people shouting for them. So I just want to pay tribute to that moment because it was a good moment for disability arts. Um, to answer the question, um, Raymond and I have both spoken about the more that you lower barriers of access to arts funding, the more that the arts funding diversifies. A couple more solutions that I, I suggested in, 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 and would um, talk a bit more about. Um, one is uh, the more equal the wages are, then the uh, more diverse the people commissioning and directing arts organisations are. I, I don't know if there's a national, national organisation or a major international festival in Scotland that has a BME chief executive. I'm not sure that there is. Um, there's certainly a major shortage of women chief executives as well. One of the reasons for that, and I did say this and it's not popular, is too much pay. They're paid, the, 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 the salaries are too high and they're way higher than the salaries of the people at the bottom. And because it's, it's an elite occupation, it's an elite occupation that is complete, being that level of chief executive is an elite occupation that is completely distant from the concerns of most artists. It, it means that the work that is getting programmed and the work that is getting commissioned is increasingly less diverse. And I, I do think there's a problem there that arts organisation, the funding of arts organisations can address, that we should not be having that inequality of pay in the arts, or anywhere for that matter, but you know, the arts is my industry. The other, the other solution I'd say is that it's not just about how the arts is funded, but which art forms are funded, that the art forms that tend to attract more funding tend to be the art forms that middle class people like and they tend to be the art forms that white people like and that that just is the situation and that is where the money is going um, it, uh, uh, I work in poetry 
poetry gets more money than hip hop, even though it's the same stuff. It just, it does, it does. And it shouldn't be that way. And, and why should hip hop, which makes more money for Scotland than poetry, by the way, um, I shouldn't be saying that as a poet, but it's true. Why, why should that get less funding? It's regarded as an art form that, sh that, that it, it's not seen as an art form that deserves that kind of funding. And the same is true for other art forms and other vectors of marginalization or vectors of inequality. So we actually have to think about which art forms is it that are valued and how are those brought in. Um, and the last point on this, there is now one Creative Scotland fund, the Create Inclusion Fund, which has just run its first round that was specifically for artists of colour in Scotland. It was peanuts. It was a fraction of the overall Creative Scotland budget and it does not go anywhere near far enough to addressing that problem. I'm glad it's there, it's nowhere near enough and it is also only there because of a lot of us doing a lot of advocacy for a long time saying that this is a problem and, it, and that's a very, very small solution that doesn't even go halfway near where we need to be. Okay, thanks. I'm going to bring in Claire Baker now. Um, thank you, convener. I suppose we came to this um, inquiry following the, the issues there were with Create Scotland's regular funding model um, and we're looking at sustainable funding but it does strike me this morning that demand is clearly outstripping supply and if you just put more money into the system it would solve um, a lot of these issues. So how do we put more money into the system or do we, because there seems to be a tension between more money going to the system or is this about Create Scotland spending the money that they have differently and cutting the pie differently and then who decides how that is divided. Um, and there also seems to be a tension between does Creative Scotland uh, focus on what we see as excellency and quality and how does that uh, present issues around diversity and how do we get and who decides. So there's, and it struck me this morning as well, running alongside us is the, the Scottish Government's um, culture strategy that the Cabinet Secretary has been consulting on. And I'm wondering whether people have any views on that. Do you think the cultural strategy is going to address these questions, is it going to resolve some of these issues? I'm a bit concerned it doesn't, I don't think it really deals with funding. And while I do accept the Scottish Government um, and the UK Government are under financial uh, pressures and it's tight budgets, the cultural budget is tiny, well, it's something like 0.2% of the overall Scottish budget goes into culture, it's tiny. Mm -hmm. Is there a need for some, kind of, even if it's longer term, and even if it's put in terms of ambition, but a recognition that more money needs to come into the system, either through government or, I don't know if we want to talk about more about local authorities, where it's not a statutory responsibility, as you've said. Um, there is a huge variety across local authorities in terms of some that will appoint a kind of cultural lead or a cultural spokesperson. Some of them don't at all. Um, and how does so that's, I guess, with a few issues kind of thrown out there, but mm. if anyone wants to pick up on, on some of these. The, uh, the best way of getting more money into the system and into every system is to raise corporation tax and raise tax on the top income bracket. So that's the answer to that one. Um, on the, I mean, I, I just, I, I've looked at the economics. I don't know any other way of doing it. Um, it's not just about raising the amount of money. I'd love to raise the amount of money in all of the publicly funded areas of life. Um, but it is, as you say, about addressing the inequalities. Um, and it, oh, I'll leave it there because I've forgotten the second question. I just wanted to say that. David. Um, I would say it's both of those issues. Yes, we need a lot more money being committed to the arts and culture. Um, and yes, it's also about how a funding body is making its decisions. And I would also say that that question of diversity and excellence it sometimes gets discussed with a, a false assumption that those two things are in conflict with each other, and they're not. It's about different types of excellence. It's about having a truly diverse understanding of what excellence means in different contexts for different cultures, about, you know, as Harry Josephine says, about respecting what, uh, for example, different, you know, working class culture has a different conception of what excellent work is to middle class tastes. And, that, and that's part of what you can start to address by bringing in a wider range of truly diverse peer review voices that you're not focusing on a small number of people making decisions. Okay. But I don't know if anybody wants to comment on, I think Rona mentioned the national companies, which obviously have protected funding and they don't come through Creative Scotland. Um, I'm not suggesting that their funding is reduced in any way, but they're in a different situation from everybody who's applying to Creative Scotland, another kind of hand-to-mouth existence, other... Um, organisations lead. 
um, do people, how do people have any views on that structure? There's been suggestions that within I know we've talked mainly this morning about the individual artists and how they could receive support. Support. There has been suggestions made that um, there should be a kind of hierarchy within Creative Scotland. It should be recognised that some venues are of greater cultural importance than others, and they should have a more secure level of funding. Or some companies, whether it's the youth companies or any, that they should have more confidence in the funding that they'll receive. I think there's, for me, a lot of this is about how we value, uh, how we value our children, how we value uh, our citizens. That's what a culture is, a kind of a real expression uh, uh, of who we are, and how we invest in that and enable uh, people to access uh, the arts is 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 a key part of that. I think um, you know there are. I suppose what, a way to look at it could be that the idea of, I suppose, what the tension there with with the regular funded organisations and project funded that you have there are we have organisations that are and buildings that will be funded a bit like the national companies they will be funded um, anyway. But is it about saying well here are your core costs here is your minimum running costs for running this building, but actually then everyone has then got uh, access to a pot of money which is about the art that we're making, um, because the the tension comes because there are the core costs of any organisation that needs to be run. But actually, artists have core costs as well. Um, but if, if extracting those core costs away from the, the pot of money that's seen for the art is, a, is an option and that makes things more transparent um, and allows us to think about things in a different way, then, then I, th I think there could be an interesting model that could come from that. Um, but yeah, for me, this, this is about how do we, how do we value um, our, our citizens and our society and the role that art has to play in that. You mentioned cultural trust being problematic, or you mm. didn't sound that... Well, you know, know local authorities know. used to have arts officers. Local authorities used to... There used to be creative links officers, culture coordinators, um, and there were people working within local arts centres who were in charge of making programming decisions about the work that they would present for their communities. Um, the introduction of cultural trust initially was quite an exciting idea that actually they had resource, and uh, that wasn't just about money, it was about space, and it was about uh, support. But gradually, over probably the last 10 years that I, I've been working with cultural trusts, that kind of, that support has kind of disappeared and the resource has disappeared and the money has disappeared. Um, so uh, the programming decisions that are being made, so when it comes to taking something out on tour across the country, you've, you don't necessarily have people who understand theatre who are making programming decisions because they're looking at something and saying, so we, the majority of work that we make is for babies, so we have capacity of 50 um, because that's the work that we make. But you don't, it doesn't necessarily cover the cost of, it's not financially viable, it's a really horrible business model, um, but uh, there is an audience for it and children have a right to it. So we are saying to this venue, we want you to take this show for your, for your audience. There's someone within that organisation saying, but that doesn't cover its costs, so why are you programming that? So in previous, uh, in previous incarnations, they would have much bigger pieces of children's work that would sell out, um, and they would offset the costs of almost like a lost leader. Um, you've got something that's gonna uh, cover its costs for, um, 10 times over that can subsidize the work that needs to be subsidized, but that doesn't happen so much is anymore. That any, is that any different with authorities that don't have cultural trust, are they well, not just... A lot of the, the authorities that don't have cultural trust are not making massive investments in the arts. Either. Yeah, Either. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But, cultural, but, but cultural trusts were generally the areas that were making more investment in the arts, yeah. in my view. Um, you know, we are an Edinburgh-based organisation and we only we applied for some support through the tattoo fund the Edinburgh City Council tattoo fund last year and received a small amount of mon money for a pilot project but that's the first time we've had any money from the the city council so at the beginning so we just say at the beginning the trust looked like a, a good model and a way to give more significance and more funding yeah and has it just been pressure on local authority funding that's led to I think pressure on local authority funding and then they started off uh, the kind of key ones that we were working with they 
really started off, it was about arts venues, museums, galleries, libraries can become involved, sports and leisure become involved. So you've then got sports and leisure managers also having to make decisions about cultural programming. Their, that, their background is in sport, sport and leisure. Their background is not in theatre, dance or cultural programming. So there's a massive tension there because you've got people who are trying to make judgments on things that they don't have the skills and expertise to do. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, in our submission we suggested that perhaps 1% of the um, government budget should be uh, uh, spent on arts and culture, just to go back to that point of more money um, I I put into the system. It's a false economy to slash funding for the arts to 0.2% of your available money, particularly for BME communities. Um, Arts and culture has always been viewed as a way of improving one's life. So is sport, particularly for our communities. But in Scotland, the route in you know, music and arts and culture for BMEs is non-existent. So what then happens is you find that young people uh, are not involved in making music, they're not involved in the culture, so they're involved in other things. Um, so government ends up paying for it through the criminal justice system anyway. So you know, uh, the isolation of people as well leads to mental health issues. So you have to pick up the cost in the NHS. So the solution, yes, is about increasing funding to the arts um, and opportunity for people to engage within the arts. Um, and I think, you know, not to spend the money there is, is, is actually a false economy. Now, how Josephine did talk about you could increase taxes, you could raise, the government could raise revenues and you could put that um, into, um, we all have different positions on that, but um, there's also been suggestions that you could, and I think it was um, Professor DeMarco talked about uh, freelancers who would work in primary schools, that kind of model, so is there potential for other budgets, whether it's health or education, to make more of a contribution uh, to their arts budget or to offer more opportunities for freelancers to work within those sectors? Do you think there could be more, um, there's potential there to Thank increase you. the income of the individual artists? Yeah, that's a... Uh, um that lets me make slightly less inflammatory suggestions. Um, one of which is, so I, I'm from Orkney. Um, Orkney still has just um, a free uh, instrument music tuition programme. Um, I think Shetland does as well. Um, which means that every child in an Orkney school gets to learn a musical instrument for free. Um, that is a remarkably cheap and remarkably effective way of both providing employment to artists and supporting the growth of a, of a culture. Orkney and Shetland have a traditional music culture and a music culture that's the envy of Scotland, the UK and, and the world. It's, an, it's a huge music culture and a huge part of life. Uh, it provides social. It provides um, a social situation. It provide. It provides tourism money. Tourism money. Um, it provides work. It's 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 vital and it is built on that thing happening in the education system. I th there may be one other local authority in Scotland that does it, but I might be wrong about that. And it's been it's been vigorously defended in Orkney and Shetland, and it's really vital that that keeps going. Systems like that provide um, extraordinary levels of well, subsidy to the arts, employment in the arts, and, and ways of strengthening an arts culture that are actually cheaper. And this, this plays into this thing of false economy, that, that, that when stuff gets cut, just like when social security stuff gets cut, just like when social care stuff gets cut, it actually becomes more expensive in other areas um, in the long run. And this, again, is tying to this business of, it's not just a Creative Scotland problem. I've remembered what your second question was earlier, which is like, can the culture strategy fix it? We've had a lot of culture reviews. I think it can only fix it if there is a broad political mission at a political level, not just to try and fix this through Creative Scotland, which, let's remember, was created to try and fix some problems in the Scottish Arts Council, so I don't want a third organisation to do the same thing. Um, it, it, it's a question of, of an overall government strategy about how all these different things link up, health, education, arts, other areas of life. So it, it needs that big level stuff or the culture, culture strategy is only so much paper. Rona, did you want to? I suppose I, uh, coming from the kind of organisation that I come from, I um, 
concerned, I have concerns about the idea of just opening up uh, a, a model that suggests that artists go into, any artist goes into schools for 50% of their time. I think working with children is a very specialist uh, way of working and it's not just anyone who can do it. I think there's, a, there's often a perception that working with children is dead easy. It's really not, it's really specialised and they deserve the best um, as much as anyone else. So I would caution the idea that it just becomes something that was kind of a free for all because it's a specialism and we need to nurture the artists who want to work with children and support them to not just be working in schools but also to make the amazing work that we're seeing at the, uh, the International Children's Festival here this week but also the work that's being presented in communities across the country. I did a recent, sorry to convene, I did recently visit um, Mick Roberts Art Centre and they employ a freelancer to do dance and drama. I think it's a year's contract but I'm yeah. not sure about that. Um, but they have employed a freelancer then to work with the community to help work with their dance and their drama groups. Is that a common model? So that's given employment to someone who is a, uh, who's a working artist um, and they as an organisation have... Is that, a, is that a common model? Are those opportunities given by other... Those opportunities are there and it's... I mean, uh, uh, Star Catchers as an organisation, that's what we do. We work... We have a pool of associate artists that maybe... 20 artists that we're working with across a year who are delivering across our programmes of work, whether that's the productions that we're making, that we're touring, whether that's our community engagement projects where we're working in places like Wester Hills, like Loch Gelly in North Ayrshire, um, supporting vulnerable families and their uh, young children to participate in artist-led activity, whether it's our creative skills training programme that is funded through Scottish Government through uh, the um, Third Sector Early Intervention Fund, we are delivering a programme that's about empowering early years prof professionals to use their innate creativity when they're working with children and families and really encourage expressive arts within our, uh, our childcare settings across the country. So we have this huge pool of artists that we are supporting. That's the working that, that are organised. We're not, we're not unique in that approach. There are lots of organisations who are working with artists in lots of different ways. That being a good artist and having those other skills are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think you could be an amazing artist in one form or another and be a really terrible teacher, or yeah. just be somebody who doesn't want to go and teach other people, or lead community workshops, or even appear publicly in any way. And I, I'm always wary of the idea of saying, well, let's let's fund people for this parallel, slightly separate thing. They can they can go into hospitals and be clown doctors. Um, <laughs> because then only some people do that. And then that replicates the problem that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, that if you come from a particular educational background, you might be good at writing a funding application. And I think if, if you have a particular type of personality, you might be good at standing up in front of groups of people and other people are really not. Thank you. Stuart, you want to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. It's uh, two uh, brief questions. First of all, uh, the Scottish Government has funded a feasibility study uh, into the, uh, an idea regarding the basic citizen's income. And it's working mm -hmm. with uh, four local authorities, Edinburgh, Glasgow, North Ayrshire and Fife. And certainly some of the submissions have suggested that uh, a basic uh, citizen's income should be introduced. Is that something that the panellists would agree with? Yes. Yes. I'm, I would say I'm very interested in knowing more about it. I'm interested in the idea that there have been some... Uh, some rolling out in other countries that have seemed to not succeed in the way that people imagined, uh, which disappointed me to read. In, th in theory, I think it's great. In reality, I want to know if it works. Okay. It certainly is a, it has to be a more efficient way of spreading uh, costs across, or spreading income across society than hugely complex benefit systems that don't really work. It has, to, it has to be much cheaper to administer and much more effective in the longer term. I haven't really looked at the economics of it because I, I cast off my accountant's hat many years ago. But, yeah, I mean, if you just think about the, the bureaucracy that has to exist to run a hugely complex benefit system, something that's bog standard simple. Everybody's on a computer system. Everybody's got a national insurance number. If there's a basic citizen's income, it probably won't cost any more than it currently costs 
to run the benefit system and disburse the benefits. Possibly it costs a lot less. But it, what it also does is that I, I touched on the point that most people in the arts are driven people. They're, they're there to do stuff. And it becomes economically impossible to do it unless you have something like that basic citizen's wage. That allows them the breathing space to, to know that their income is coming in, that they can actually sit down and write that piece of music that's been bothering them. This happens to me on a daily basis. I go out for a walk and I come back with a new melody or a new uh, uh, idea for an arrangement. Uh, I don't have the time to write it down and I don't have any market for it because there's so little work out there. So we can start, that's one way that these issues can be addressed. Um, the other thing that strikes me, putting my accountant's hat back on for a minute, is that um, the, the arts aren't just for now, it's the future. So the funding of local authorities, local authorities are the education system in general is key to ensuring the cultural future. And it seems to me that that is a no-brainer. That has to happen. Yeah, For local authorities to be in the position, uh, I'm very aware that this isn't entirely a Scottish problem because Scottish economy, uh, the governmental economy, is largely dispersed from elsewhere. But if you, if you squeeze the local authorities, the first, one of the first things that, can, that will go, as we've, as we've seen, it's, it's happened widely across Scotland, is that uh, cultural education programmes get slashed. And that longer term is fatal you know, to, to the arts community, but it's fatal to, to the wider society as well. So I think this all, all of this, I mean, these are hugely political questions, but all of these factors are interrelated. And we have to ensure that this, the local authorities can actually provide a basis for the nation's culture. If we don't do that, what are we going to finish up as? Thank you. Did you want to come in there, Raymond? No. no. I agree <laughs> with nodding. everybody. Yeah, that would be right. and, uh, and my second question is just it's regarding regional funding. Um, we've heard of a number of words spoken today, and one of which was about the elite uh, in terms of allocating uh, funding. Um, there are 32 local authorities in Scotland, uh, and uh, understandably the bulk of monies goes towards the cities. Uh, but there, are, there is always a hinterland outside of the cities. Um, do the panellists feel as if the other areas outside of the cities actually get a fair, get a fair deal? I'm, I'm from Orkney. No, it doesn't get a fair deal in terms of... Um in terms of national arts funding, um, it doesn't get as much funded work going, going to Orkney or being made in Orkney. Um, it, Orkney has uh, benefited a lot from European Union funding in various areas, including the arts, and that's really worrying for me. So no wonder we had the highest Remain vote in Scotland. Um, so, so it's really worrying for me um, that that is being taken away. And European Union funding it has also been a major factor in other rural areas because it does tend to end up there in lots of different ways. Um, in terms of the ways that actually plays out, um, it's both, it's the ability to make art in Orkney and have that be funded. Orkney is somewhere, I mentioned it in music, but is somewhere with an extraordinary level of what we might call amateur or community participation in the arts. I do not know a person in Orkney who is not involved in artistic production in some form, but the vast majority of them are not paid for it. Um, the va and, and, and that is also okay. Not everyone has to make it their job. Some people don't want it to be their job, but the people who are involved in that way deserve to have support for that work, whether it's support for the buildings that they make it happen in, whether it's support for resources. And I, I really, I, I, one thing I spoke about in my evidence was needing to, to not make this purely about professional arts, but consider how the non-professional sector and the professional sector overlap, how the people who do it for a job and the people who do it for pleasure are benefiting from the same systems. So that money needs to go in there. And that, I think, is always going to be especially the case in rural areas. Um, because there are fewer arts jobs there, but also because there's a more 
communitarian form of life. That means that, that you have this kind of community participation in the arts. The other aspect of it in the very rural areas is what work tours to rural areas. Um, if you want to take work to Orkney, I just did two weeks ago. It's really expensive. Like, it is really expensive to take anything of any... Um, com complex level to rural areas and the ven and it's it's harder to get into the venues because the venues are smaller um, there are attempts to address this issue of rural touring I don't think that they've quite managed it yet and there is absolutely the demand for that in rural areas they really want to be seeing this work um, but but there is a lack of funding to make that happen thank you Ross, did you want to come in or are you...? Yeah, if that's possible, yeah. come in. I have something to, to add to that, though. I've, I've always been frustrated that, that the way that we talk about allocation of funds between the central belt and rural areas seems to mostly focus on where organisations are based. And I don't think that's an accurate way of measuring provision. I think that because there's so much work that tours somebody... Yeah, I, I think it's... I would like to really know what's going on. A cultural practitioner. So I represent a rural area myself from the point of view of cultural practitioners based in those rural areas who wish to make a career while staying mm. in the area, I think it probably is quite important. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that it's not. I'm yeah. saying that it's really hard for us to measure, that we don't, we don't really know yeah. um, the balance between uh, people who are... For example, somebody could be based in a rural area and working there, but the majority of the work that they show might be being shown in cities, and we don't have a way of measuring it, and I think that's um, not helpful. I agree with that point, but I think there's also there's other things that are going on that allow work to happen. So one of our projects that has been working in Ayrshire and in Murray with local artists and uh, supporting them, but that, again, that was third sector early intervention funding, working with kinship carers and um, kind of that sense that we are based in Edinburgh, but we have the, that scope to... Uh, and the partnerships that we have allow us to work in those areas and ensure that um, that people across the country are able to uh, access and participate in, in those experiences. Actually, very quickly, just um, when you're talking about being able to access your early years funding, and I haven't seen any of your work, but I'm sure it's absolutely of the highest quality, but did you think that you it was helpful in terms of your RFO application that you did have that other funding stream from early years because there is a lot of money going into early years? Uh, uh, yes, I mean, it, I suppose as an organisation, we have had to diversify in that way because we have three very distinct pillars that are interconnected, the producing and touring work, our engagement work, and this sort of professional development aspect. Um, and that has evolved over the last 12 years since we began in Muir House um, as a pilot project. So um, I think the, the fact that we were able to um, have that consistent support, so that was three, uh, three, three years of funding from Scottish Government that was then extended for uh, 1920 um, that contributes a proportion towards our core but also supports us to deliver this training programme and then we also had this um, project fund for um, the last couple of years. Um, I think what that uh, allowed us to demonstrate to Create Scotland is that um, we are able to look at a portfolio of funders to support the delivery of our work and we were asking them to fund a very specific um, part of that. They funded 50% of that, of what we, our ask was, so we're still in a, a kind of slightly limbo position with actually being able to produce and tour, but we can develop new work and we can support artists to explore and make what, uh, how they want to make work for um, not to fives in Scotland. But um, I think absolutely the the, the other re uh, resource that we've levied, big lottery money, um, Scottish government money has allowed us to, to, it was a real kind of um, bonus to that um, application process. Thank you. Ross. Thanks, come here. Um, two questions, but for the sake of time, one of them is essentially just yes, no. Going back to the wants to come in as well so no, if you just I will, ask one I'll question the, then we'll I'll go to the yes no one then um, the other question is um, we've had a lot of feedback 
particularly during the, the last um, episode of, of this, from artists who felt that there was an increasing amount of pressure to demonstrate a strong business case rather than purely artistic uh, merit when uh, applying for funding. And that's something we've, we've discussed this morning. But the cultural sector is a significant sector of Scotland's economy. And one of the strongest arguments that you can make to get funding is to talk about economic output. That's not all that art is. That's very, very far from all that art is. But how, how do you balance that tension between the fact that we do want to fund art for art's sake and how culturally enriching it is in and of itself. But this is a significant sector of Scotland's economy. How do we balance something between arts funding and what is essentially enterprise funding? Sorry, that was a yes-no question. No, that's not. That's, that's not. I jettisoned the yes-no okay. question. <laughs> Um, um, personally, I don't think it's that difficult to strike a balance. My company has always been a very well-run business, um, and we also made great art. I think it's possible to do it. I think you can judge those things at the same time. I would say that's not just a problem for arts funding. One of the biggest problems that we've faced is that venues are obsessed with how many tickets your work is going to sell, to a degree that's much more extreme than it used to be. And so... Um, yeah, a lot of the time that business pressure is coming from venues saying we like your work but we need something that's going to sell out. There's actually two distinct things that you're talking about in the business case there and one is the business case for individual artists or arts organisations the other is the business case if we want to call it that the economic impact case for the arts as a whole um, the in economic impact case for the arts as a whole is incredibly strong for all the reasons that have come up around the table um, we, 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 we absolutely bring in more money than is spent on the arts and we have all sorts of social benefits the kind that Raymond has talked about um, that can't always be adequately measured in economic impact, but can be. I don't think it's possible for individual artists or arts organisations to individually say we're responsible for this slice of that pie of the massive economic and social benefit in the arts. I also don't really think it's honestly possible for any arts organisation that is in receipt of public funding to say that they're making a business case. We're not. None of us are profitable businesses. We're not there to make a profit. In fact, most of the time, we have to be not for profit. Most of the time, our tickets are subsidised. Like, my Massively subsidised. Um, and they have to be, or the art doesn't happen for all of the sorts of reasons that we're talking about. We can't make individual business cases for our funding. Um, the other aspect of all of this is that the stuff that, that does genuinely make money, let's say like a big musical, that, that can be a for-profit business. That business musical only exists because of the subsidised sector. An actor that works in a musical is probably working in the subsidised sector as well. They've probably been trained in some way in the subsidised sector. They might work in education sometimes. The subsidised and unsubsidised sectors are this huge overlap. And, and we, so we, that's another reason that we can't say, this bit of the arts makes a profit, so let's put some money into it. This bit of the arts doesn't, so let's not put Because it's all one big system. So we need to talk about the overall impact, not the impact of these individual individual organisations and don't make us prove it because we can't or we I mean we try but we're lying when we do it we do it every time but we're lying we know we're lying and people who fund us know that we're lying it's all a big game Annabelle um, yeah so in terms of the broader discussion about funding and given the public funding constraints that people have referred to um, my question would be how do we uh, go about encouraging greater private investment in the arts You mentioned that you had uh, operated your um, organisation for a long time with zero funding. That's right. What advice would you give to um, to people nowadays who um, want to operate without subsidy? Well, I think it was the most productive period for me. And it was the time when I had to make sure that the Edinburgh International Festival uh, was all about... Uh, the use of language, which is not just English, because uh, when the English language predominated the Edinburgh Festival fringe, uh, you, ha you didn't have an international um, uh, event. And I remember having to rely on, well, it's all about <clears throat> the one thing that's not yet been mentioned, and that is uh, how you 
the art originates and is maintained in friendship. And that means uh, friendship between a group of human beings with uh, shared ideals and hopes and aspirations. It means that the uh, decisions are made by a group of human beings who demand something that isn't yet uh, being made available in society. And I was thinking of the groups of human beings that I was privileged to work with who wanted the spirit of the Edinburgh Festival to be uh, in existence uh, in the remaining 49 weeks of the year. The, the, the feeling that you're in an international city, a European city, not a Scottish city, not a British city. And they produced an extraordinary um, uh, set of circumstances which didn't depend on money at all. It simply depend on shared values and desperately wanting uh, to feel that they, that they belong to something bigger than Scotland. And that thing was the, uh, the, the, that which was the greatest gift given to Scotland, which was the feeling that we were not just dependent on Scottish history, but on European cultural history. I advise everyone um, who's here today to read a book which has become a great success worldwide. It's now translated from um, English into Spanish. Um, it's entitled Reclaiming Art in the Age of Artifice. I think we're living in an age of artifice, of artificiality, of um, dumbing down, of um, uh, a world in which false truth, uh, fake news, is as prominent as the real thing. And I think that w the word reclaiming art is the key word that we should all be thinking about today. Art has been taken away from the hands of artists and placed into the power base of those that are, at this moment, better paid, more secure, and more powerful in society. You mentioned Hugh McDermott. How do you think he would have survived in the current climate of he, he, funding. he would be in a, a state of rage. He <laughs> 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 was always in a state of rage, but I mean, it would have been increased to an amazing level. He was um, ignored, of course, by the Edinburgh Festival, and I, I celebrated his 100th uh, anniversary. He was then, of course, dead by presenting him as part of uh, uh, the official Edinburgh Festival. I paid for the whole thing. And I made it an international event. Because the one outstanding thing that we must see is as soon as we use the language of art, we're breaking down all national artificial barriers in time and space. We're speaking in the language which endures powerfully across the ages. And I'm thinking that um, I rely on what the artist says, what Hugh McDermott was saying in his lifetime. I'll never forget that moment in a pub when we were sitting together and he said, don't forget that uh, Scotland uh, has a future in the wider world. And he reminded me of the fact that he once went to Venice to meet Ezra Pound uh, because it was necessary for someone from Scotland to speak to this extraordinary human being who was one of the great poets alive at the time. And um, he said, this kind of dialogue, this kind of um, international world, which he, Ezra Pound represented, w was, it, it belongs to us as, as, as well as... Uh, uh, all those people from all over the world who, who, who regard him as important. And he went all the way, all the way to Venice 
to have that conversation. And in a way, one single human being with very little resources in terms of actual money took the trouble to have that conversation. Now, I'm concerned that art is not in the hands of artists. And I think all of us here who represent this parliament uh, should ask the ma major question, uh, because it's been asked so many times, you know, uh, who, what is our peer group? Uh, I mean, who are, we, uh, who, who are we in the hands of? Well, it's the case that in my long life, I've seen uh, that art is not really about artists. It's about the administration of art, the, 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 the well, the commodifying uh, of the language of art so that it represents uh, that one element which has to be present in all art expression, which is it removes risk so that, for example, um, you, you, you are guaranteed five star, seven star success uh, in the Edinburgh Festival official program instead of the risk of finding that you have to deal with a play written in blank verse, which was T.S. Eliot's contribution to a very early play in, in the 50s in Edinburgh, a play written in blank verse, and another play which was in the French language, which would guarantee a very small audience, okay? And I'm thinking, we are we're avoiding the one thing that all great artists um, use most effectively, and that is uh, the element of risk seeing the future, seeing that part of the reality that we have to deal with, which is beyond any quantifying process in, in any system where we can guarantee that we're, not, we're on safe ground. I think we'll just stop it there because we're looking at the future and I think that's a good place to stop it. So thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much. Um, and we uh, will now wind up. And I just before we do wind up, um, I should say that we have had apologies for Jamie Green today, so that is now on the record. Thank you very much. We'll now move into private session. Thanks to you all for coming today, making a contribution.